first. Good job, Margaret. Now let's share the screen. Okay. Okay. Let's just let it get set up. What you should see is a document with today's, the table of contents for today's class. We see it. Okay. Just waiting for this beach ball to finish its business. So I can move the document. There we go. Okay. All right, here. Yeah. Continuing our deep dive on meditation and self mastery, we are going to review the nuts and bolts of the Ramchal's Mesilat Yesharim, the path of the just. Hmm. And we're going to look at it and see its similarities to what we've been studying from Rabbi Kaplan and from Bonte. So we'll get to that in a second. We're also going to con we're also going to focus on concentration on all activities from with Bonte. And prior to starting our med our, our that section of the class, I am going to answer the question: What do you do when you're reluctant to become mindful? It is a universal dilemma. And I'm going to provide an answer to that. Okay. So, Rabbi Kaplan, in his discussion of meditation and remolding the self, mentioned the Musar movement and um, how the Musar movement designed programs for self perfection and using various forms of meditation. And that's exciting because it shows how a, a whole branch of Judaism was dedicated to this pursuit using meditation, a variety of, of, of meditation forms. It's wonderful. It's encouraging and, it, and, it, and it, it's validation to Rabbi Kaplan's premise that we were once heavy meditators in all our spiritual pursuits and unfortunately we lost it and that's why we are committed in this class to recapturing um those spiritual pursuits okay so let us then go right to the ramchal so bear with me a quick second we'll share again Mm -hmm. Hold on. Okay. Okay, there we go. So now, let us share again. Okay, what you should be seeing now is a chapter, a path of the just, chapter two, the trait of watchfulness. Okay, so interesting. And as I mentioned, this is a really um, thorough and comprehensive uh, translation and commentary of this great Musar work. Uh, it appears on dafyomireview. Oops. dafyomireview.com. And there's 10 different sources being used, including 
provided by Rabbi Abigdor Miller. How about that? Mm -hmm. And David Svi Hoffman, another noteworthy in modern times. So there are some heavy hitters being used for uh, under to help us understand what this text is about. Obviously, I'm not an expert, but we're going to get into it to the point where we can distill something out of it uh, and relate it to what we've been learning. So the Ramchal starts out talking about what he calls the trait of watchfulness. And this is what the translation says. And here's the original Hebrew. The idea of watchfulness is for one to be cautious of his deeds and matters, namely contemplating and watching over his deeds and ways, whether they are good or evil, not abandoning his soul to the danger of destruction, God forbid, and not walking through the course of habit like a blind man in darkness. Reason certainly obligates this. For after a person has knowledge and reason to save himself and escape from the destruction of his soul, how is it conceivable that he would willingly blind his eyes from saving himself? There is certainly no debasement and foolishness worse than this. One who does this is lower than beasts and wild animals, whose nature it is to protect themselves, escaping and fleeing from whatever seems harmful to them. And there are some interesting commentaries on this. That's a very deep idea. Um, one commentary is the attainment of watchfulness depends on recognizing clearly that without it, a man is in extremely great danger, as explained in the previous chapter, meaning you can end up going through all the motions of religious living and it won't mean a thing to you. What a waste. Okay. And interesting, the second commentary says, watchfulness is recognizing the great responsibility in all of one's actions. The words watchfulness, zehirut, is from the word zohar, shining light. Thus, to be watchful is to shine light on all one's deeds. Whoa. For one who is not watchful walks in darkness, the darkness of habit. The mind of one who learns Torah becomes illuminated, and thus, since his mind has light, he has the power to see, and he becomes watchful. What other word can be used for watchfulness here? Yep, I heard that. Mindfulness. Whoa. The Ramchal is talking about mindfulness here. How? To be, let's, let's change the word watchful to mindful. To be mindful is to shine light on all one's deeds. For one who is not mindful walks in darkness, the darkness of habit. The mind of one who learns Torah becomes illuminated. And thus, since his mind has light, he has the power to see and he becomes mindful. Ah. Well. The Ramchal is emphasizing that we need to be mindful of all our deeds so that we see, as we've been saying, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And when you learn Torah, you are doing what? You are programming yourself to emphasize the good stuff. Your default will be just doing whatever your animal nature or your unmindfulness leads you to do. Your mind controls you. And you're going to end up doing the most, you know, acting out of fear, acting out of self-protection, you know, all the animal natures. You know, our mind is filled with stuff that's about us and our fears. But, and we need to be mindful of that so that when we reprogram ourselves, the mind of one who learns Torah, reprogramming ourselves through Torah, it's like, ah, I want to reject. I'm aware of the good, the bad, and the ugly. I want to reject the bad and the ugly in favor of the stuff that I've been teaching myself. So they're basically saying, if you don't take the effort to learn about the good stuff and prioritize that, then your default position will be doing the bad stuff. That's not to say that we're born bad. That's a whole other question. 
that's saying that our default will be our instinctive, self-protective, mean nature. And, um, and this relates to what we've been talking about earlier, where those of us that are, that are talking about the contents of our mind, you see how much of it is negative. Why is it negative? Because there's a part of us that says, no, 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 out of self-protection. Okay, there's a lot, this is not good, this is not good, this is bad, this is not good, this is not good. It's, it's keeping stuff away out of self-protection. So we know that. So the goal, and, and we form the habit of becoming so self-protective and going through the motions, just don't bother me. Okay. But when we program ourselves to write stuff, then we become mindful slash watchful and we make the conscious decision. I want to follow the programming I've been doing of Tara stuff as opposed to the, the program I've been following. I'm just doing whatever. Conscious decision. And that's what Bonte has been telling us the whole time. The key to being able to make the right choice in terms of what you're going to think and what you're going to do is being aware of it all, watching all and say, ah, I choose that, not this. So what the Ramachal is teaching us is right part and parcel part of what we've been talking about with Bonte and Rabbi Kaplan and this whole 18 months. Hmm. One who, the, the Ramchal continues, one who walks along in, this, in his world without contemplating whether his ways are good or evil is similar to a blind man walking on the bank of a river. His danger is certainly very great and his calamity is more likely than his escape. For negligence in guarding oneself from danger due to natural blindness and negligence due to willful blindness namely shutting one's eyes by choice and desire, is one and the same. Ah, so we got an option. We have free will. We can basically say, forget about it. Not interested. Ah, so he's basically saying mm -hmm, that if he does not look, commentary here, the chance of failing is very, falling is very high, and most likely it will happen. Okay. You're going to be blundering around. So he's actually saying that bad things, you increase the possibility of, of bad things happening by choosing to remain blind and not making conscious decisions to do this as opposed to that, to change your habits. Bad habits can lead to bad things. Good habits can lead to good things. We've got a whole talk about that in Bahukotai. Right? That's coming up. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now the Ramchal brings us to Yirmiyahu. Jeremiah would bemoan on the evil of his contemporaries affliction with the disease of this trait, being unmindful, unwatchful. They would turn a blind eye to their deeds and not putting heart to consider what they were doing, whether to do or refrain from doing it. Regarding them, he said, he again being Jeremiah, no man regrets of his evil saying, what have I done? Each one running to his own course as the horse rushes into the battle. The explanation is that they would pursue and go by the momentum of habit and conduct without leaving themselves time to consider their deeds and ways. Thus they fell into evil without even seeing it. In truth, this is one of the cunning strategies of the evil inclination to constantly burden people's hearts with his service so as to leave them no room to look and consider which road they are taking. For he knows that if they were to put their ways to heart even the slightest bit, certainly they would immediately begin to feel regret for their deeds. He is the Yetzer, is the, is the evil inclination here. The remorse would go and intensify within them until they would abandon the sin completely. Wow, so the Ramchal is equating, is, is saying, this is the Yetzer Hara. 
the Yetzahara, the evil inclination, is when your mind takes over, you do things out of habit, you just do things instinctively without thinking about what you're doing, without asking why you're doing things, without saying, I choose to do this as opposed to that. And that's the same kind of condition that we've been talking about with the meditation, when your mind just takes over and, and you just follow your mind wherever it's going. If the content of your mind's chiefly are like all negative stuff or instinctive stuff, that's what you're gonna end up, that's how you're gonna, that's what you're gonna end up doing. Isn't that interesting? Ah, this is similar to the wicked Pharaoh's advice saying, intensify the men's labor. His intention was to leave them no time whatsoever to oppose him or plot against him. He strove to confound their hearts of all reflection by means of the constant and sense of labor. He chose to bombard them and overwhelm their system, like keep working, keep working, double the load, double the load, same time, double the load, and leaving no time for them to say, wait a minute, this Pharaoh's wrong. We can't do this. Sorry. Of course, eventually the Hebrews did, and they called out to God. God said, came to the rescue. But he's saying, this is the, the mind, the, the ordinary mind, the, the, the mind that just churns stuff is, is like that, just saying, just keeps you occupied. Do this, you know, compulsively, obsessively, on and on and on, do this, do this, do this, do this without any thought. It, it wants to keep you so busy, said the Ramchal, you have no time to think and say, wait a minute, I'm in charge here. Yep, that's a pretty good analogy. This is precisely the ploy employed by the evil inclination on human beings, for he is a skilled warrior. He again is the evil inclination, expert in the art of cunning. It is impossible to escape from him without great wisdom and far-reaching vision. This is what the prophet screamed out, give heed to your ways. And as Shlomo in his wisdom said, give not sleep to your eyes nor slumber to your eyelids, save yourself as a deer from the hand of the hunter and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. That's so interesting. So, so the Ramchal is interpreting Shlomo HaMelech in Proverbs and Mishle as basically saying, you're like a deer in the sight of a hunter because this, this, this Yetzahara, this mind, runaway mind, is like a hunter going for you, and it's going to get you unless you unless you turn the unless you turn the unless you turn the corner unless you turn around and you say you take charge of what's going on, um, and it should be vigilant. It should be something that you run to do. Um, don't sleep. Don't you know? Make it a priority. To, to take charge of your mind and train your mind to do the right thing um, as opposed to just the wrong thing, as opposed to just what it, its default position is, which is just me, 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 quickest way out, you know, self-protective. And our sages of blessed memory said, whoever scrutinizes his ways in this world merits to see the salvation of the Holy One, blessed be he. And it is obvious that even if one is watchful over himself, as, and as we're saying, mindful, it is not within his power to save himself without the help of the Holy One, blessed be he. For the evil inclination is enormously powerful, as scripture says, the wicked watches the righteous and seeks to slay him. God will not forsake him through his power. All right, but that's, it. that's in a way saying that you can't, when it says, you can't do this without God's help, right. You can't do this without God's help through Torah, right. What's the significance of Torah here? It's programming yourself to do the right thing. You can't, if you have a bad program running as your operating system, the way you do things, it has to be replaced by a better operating system 
that has commands for you to do the right thing. It needs a new system. And I will add, this is like so much about what the Rambam and other people say is the purpose of Torah. It is a replacement system of living over the pagan and heathen world um, in which the Jews were living. It's a replacement system. So he says, we need to each develop a replacement operating system within us. And that's how we'll be able to gain control over our crazy mind because when the mind starts churning out all kinds of bad commands, instead of following it, we'll, we'll default to the, to the new commands. They said, no, I'm not going to be eating the, the five ice cream cones today. I'm just going to be going home and doing 55 push-ups. You know, the whole, you know what I'm saying. So new programming. So this is the Torah way. This is the, um, the Ramchal's way of describing what the mechanics that we've been discussing in terms of programming your mind, being mindful, making the right decision as to where you're going to focus your energy. This is a fundamental Jewish idea. And he wraps up by saying in this chapter, if a man is watchful, meaning mindful, over himself, then the Holy One, blessed be he, helps him, and he will be saved from the evil inclination, meaning from his mind running amok. But if he is not watchful over himself, meaning mindful, the Holy One, blessed be he, will certainly not watch over him. For if he gives no heed to himself, who should give heed to him? This is as our sages of blessed memory have said, it is forbidden to pity anyone who has no knowledge. And this is the, it's from the Gemara, and this is the meaning of what they said. If I am not for myself, who will be for me? Ah, so they took that saying of, uh, from Pirkei Avot, from, from, from Hillel, and they basically says, that applies to God too. If you are not helping yourself, the message here is by using the teachers of the Torah from God to program yourself to do the right stuff, what do you expect God to do? Hmm. Okay. And through his own free will and desire, he chooses, he will not choose and conduct himself according to his knowledge of what is right. He won't know what to do. This is why Jews place such an emphasis on education, the right education, because it helps us program ourselves to do the right thing. This stuff is yummy. Okay. Now, what do we got here? Let us go back to the document. Okay, we got that. Okay, now the question we want to address before we go into Bonte is just wait for this for a second. Okay. How to deal with reluctance to be mindful? Boy, is that a timely question. Because we just went through the Ramakal stating in no uncertain terms, you have to be mindful, otherwise your life, you're going to waste your life. Okay. Thanks, buddy. Easier said than done. Okay. So this is my two cents on the question. And as we go on, I'm sure we'll develop other thoughts. Okay, first of all, in my understanding is, we all do that, that's very common. We all have stuff we don't wanna look at with the light of the Zohar. Everybody does that, okay. You just wanna react, you do, I'm gonna do what I wanna do, okay? I don't wanna have to think about it. It could be with regards to a relationship with a boss or, or anybody else. It could be regarding your health, it could be regarding your exercise regimen. There's certain things you just want to do it, not think about it, go through the motions. Okay. The good news 
as I see it, is that that itself is mindfulness. You're already mi more mindful. You're mindful of the fact that you don't want to look at that stuff. That is a layer of self-awareness. So as much as you don't want to be mindful, the fact that you know you don't want to be mindful means you're mindful in a, <laughs> in a different level. So that actually is good because um, the name of the game is becoming more mindful and becoming mindful of your desire to not be mindful is progress. How do you like that? Okay. Now bear in mind that that's not the same thing as conscience. Even the Ramchal said that. We need to be watchful. Um, and there are certain things, you know, you don't, you don't want, like Bonte says, you don't want to beat yourself up with the fact that you're a little bit reluctant to dive deep. Okay. Um, you might even feel bad about the fact that you don't want to dive deep. Dive deep. Um, you don't want to become mindful of a certain situation. Okay. That's not the same thing as conscious. We're talking about mindful here. Okay. We're really just concerned about awareness. Okay. So I have two, I have two solutions, an, an indirect and a direct solution. Well, they're kind of indirect and select, direct. Um, point number one is mindfulness will grow organically as you focus on other areas. As here, meaning it's okay to say, um, I don't want to pay too much attention or take a deep dive on my relationship with my boss. Okay. Okay. Um, you can choose to not shine the light there, but you certainly would shine the light in other areas. You'd become more mindful on your eating. You'd become more mindful on your learning. You become more mindful as you dive in, whatever the situation is. Mindfulness is a compound thing. So even begrudgingly, you are going to become a little bit more mindful of that which you don't want to be mindful about, like your relationship with your boss, because you are going to become mi more mindful in other areas, and there's going to be seepage. That's how we work. You know, that's why, that's why people say, even if you've been, if you've been, if you've been failing at keeping the, eat, keeping the right diet and eating the right foods, but you've been succeeding in doing your exercise, the, the success you experience in doing your exercise, that momentum will carry over into eating and you'll become more successful eventually in the eating too. And there'll be a, a residual effect, a sharing effect of victories from one area le leaking into another area. So similarly, as you become mindful in other areas besides your relationship with your boss, um, you will naturally start become mindful of relationship with the boss, even though you're not intending to. That's number one. Number two, um, I think there can be also a more focused seepage, meaning let's say that you don't want to become mindful of your relationship with your boss. Okay, let's say your boss is a man. Um, you could say, ah, well, I'm going to become a little bit more mindful of relationship with another man, let's say my neighbor, who's a man. And you, and you decide to intentionally become a little bit more mindful in how you act, how you speak, what you think, how you feel about your neighbor. Okay. That, that person is, you know, in your mind, a little bit similar to your boss, maybe they're both males, maybe they're similar age group, things like this. And the mindfulness you develop in your relationship with your, your neighbor will carry over into your relationship with your boss, because they're similar thing, they're similar type um, people. That happens. Um, so you may find, for example, you know, I've seen this up, I've had this happen. You have an employee, let's say both are women and the, if you become more mindful of your relationship with, with Alice, then even without attending to, you become a little bit more mindful of your relationship with Mary and you're like, oh, there's a little bit of similarity there. I get, oh, she does this and she does that. I get this. It's going to be natural carryover. So those are two ways where you don't have to just dive in and become mindful about something you're really reluctant to. 
It's going to happen organically because in general you're becoming more mindful. And it can, if you want, become, you can become more mindful in particular by um, becoming more mindful in a, 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 about something in a, that's, that's similar. Those work. That's what I got to offer on that at the present time. Okay. Let us now venture forth with Bhante. Learn a little lesson from him. And again, the premise of Bhante is you got to get off the cushion. You, you, you do, we do still do seated meditation, but the ultimate goal is carry that mindfulness off the cushion into everyday life. He talked last week about dividing your day into chunks. So you could say, all right, today I'm going to be mindful of myself when I eat. Tomorrow I'll be mindful of myself when I dress. Then the next day I'll be mindful of myself when I daven. The next thing, and on and on and on. Okay. Your practice must be made to apply to your everyday living situation. That is your laboratory. It provides the trials and challenges you need to make your practice deep and you need to make your practice deep and genuine. Yeah, your day is your life is your lab. It's the fire that purifies your practice of deception and error. The acid test that shows you when you are getting somewhere and when you are fooling yourself. If your meditation isn't helping you to cope with everyday conflicts and struggles, then it is shallow. If your day-to-day -day emotional reactions are not becoming clearer and easier to manage, then you are wasting your time. And you never know how you are doing until you actually make the test. This is really important. How do you know you are successfully taking the skills on the cushion, off the cushion? You know if you are able to cope better with everyday conflicts and struggles if you are more clear on your emotional reactions and finding it easier to manage them those are the indicators that you are successfully transferring the skills off the cushion if those are not happening if you are not better able to cope with everyday conflicts and struggles if you are not more aware of your emotional reactions and uh, finding it easier to manage them, then you are not meditating enough. And as Bhante says, you are wasting your time. What's, what's the good news? The good news is get on the cushion more. Instead of doing 10 minutes a week, do 10 minutes a day. Instead of doing 10 minutes a day, do 20 minutes a day. You, you will find out what you need. And the only way you'll find out is if you try to meditate, so to speak, in everyday life, meaning, what am I, ask yourself, what am I aware of right now? Am I aware of myself? Am I aware of what am I doing? What am I doing right now? You, start, you gotta start conducting the test to see how mindful you are, and then you'll take it from there. And that is a good lead-in for us to go to meditation. <laughs>